You may be familiar from your childhood with the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. Right? And while that's a great sentiment to share with kids as they try and get over being called names and things, we all know that's really a bunch of crap, right? Sticks and stones can hurt your bones, but so can words. Words can hurt very badly. They can also help, and that's the great thing about language. But, but language has a tremendous impact, and that's what I want to focus on in this video. The impact that language has in our life, and the impact of verbal communication in our lives. So, let's start by talking about the impact as it relates to naming and identity. We you know, know that names have a tremendous impact. That's why parents spend so much time agonizing over what to name their kids, right? And uh, so, um, but, but it has to do with identity and can have a very strong impact there. And not just on individuals, but on what we name groups, for example. Think about the impact of, of uh, the names that have been associated with African Americans over the years and where those um, kind of, kind of uh, names uh, for that group have come from, uh, who established that name and who's able to choose that name and taking the power back in those names and, and, uh, and the pride that went along with that identity of, of any group. It's not just African Americans, but any cultural group, even, you know, as we look at women, um, we don't use the, the expression girl anymore like they did in the 60s he's just go oh, have the girl do it have the you know in the office you might just say oh have the have the girl do it um, or the girls will take care of it we don't use that anymore because it has a different uh, meaning that name and identity has a different impact and different purpose right so uh, naming as an individual and as a group can have a tremendous impact and uh, language can uh, be very powerful in that regard we also look at affiliation Language can signal affiliation with a group or it can signal disaffiliation with a group, meaning separation from that group. So, for example, we look at affiliation when someone adopts the language of a particular group. It's something we call convergence. They accept that and they really that indicates that they are uh, desirous of being a part of that group. You see this a lot, for example, in the military. The military, all the branches of the military kind of have their own language, right? That they use different words for specific things. And they really indoctrinate people. When you enter the military, you are trained to use these words. Part of that is is for clarity when they're talking about things, but the other part is for um, affiliation, for that convergence. They want people to really use that language to signal that they are a part of that particular branch of the military. That part, they're part of that unit. They're kind of buying in to that affiliation, as opposed to if you there, there are groups to, that may have language that you refuse to to use, that you refuse to adopt. That is what we would call divergence, signaling you know a lack of affiliation. I am not a part of this group, and so I'm not adopting that language. So language can be very powerful in, in the sense of affiliation as well. It can also, as we know, have a great deal of power uh, in terms of um, establishing power. And when we use a particular type of language, we use that to express power over somebody else or to establish power over somebody else. Uh, and conversely, it can be used for politeness. Language can be um, very um, helpful in, in being polite. The way we choose to phrase something, though, really indicates kind of are we giving an order and establishing power or are we asking for something? Are we being polite? Are we, you know, the, so the different words that we choose can, can really signal different things there. Right? And then finally, we know that language is obviously very much a part of sexism and racism. Um, when we choose particular language, it indicates, uh, you know, sexist or racist views and so forth. And where the lack of those things is, you know, would identify more, um, a more evolved view of those things. So, um, sexism and racism very much connected to language and, and language has a very um, big impact on those areas. Uh, language also has an impact in terms of precision and vagueness. Um, language can be very, very precise or it can be very vague and, and abstract. So well, we look at things like ambiguous language. Sometimes we choose to be unclear um, and, and we use that as a strategy. And other times we're ambiguous and we don't mean to be and it causes confusion, but we need to be aware of that. We can also look at abstraction again. We can make choices regarding abstraction. There's what we call the ladder of abstraction, which you can see here. Um, that the, uh, you know, one end of the ladder has very abstract 
language and, and an abstract idea of more vague. The other end is more concrete detail, very specific. So if we look at the word war, uh, war is very abstract. It could mean a lot of things from you know armed conflict to the game that you play with cards. Um, and even if we just narrow it down to armed conflict, there's lots of different wars, right? But if we could get more and more specific as we go down the ladder of abstraction toward that concreteness, we see that uh, we can be more specific by identifying World War II, for example. That excludes all the other wars and focuses on that one. Still a lot there, though. We can be more specific by talking about D-Day or specifically the, the beaches at Normandy, right? So we get more and more concrete as we uh, get to the other end of that ladder and get away from abstraction. Now, again, abstraction sometimes is a strategy. It depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Sometimes we want more abstract language, and other times we, we ought to be more concrete, though. So we need to make appropriate choices with our language in that regard. Sometimes we also use euphemism as a form of vagueness, right? It's sometimes not pleasant to talk about things like when somebody dies. It's it's It can be um, not an easy topic to address. So we use words that are a little softer, expressions that are a little softer. We call that euphemism. So instead of saying somebody died, maybe, maybe we say they passed away or they passed on, um, they've, they've gone to heaven, so forth. Those are euphemisms, all to express the fact that somebody's no longer living, uh, but it softens that up a little bit. What's a relative language? If I were to ask you, you know, did you come from a small town? Uh, some people would raise their hands and say yes. And then we would ask, you know, we could ask how small a town. And some people would say, you know, well, I'm from a town of only 50,000 people. And they consider that small. Other people would say, well, I'm from a town of 500 people. And that's obviously small. But it really just depends on, you know, if you're from that town of 50,000 people, but that town is near a city of you know, 2 million people, then it's going to seem small, right, in, in comparison. So language is relative. Or if I said, you know, I'll be there soon, what does that mean? Soon is relative. For me, it may mean tomorrow. And for you, it may mean in five minutes. So language is relative. It can vary in that precision and vagueness as well. Uh, well, so the precision and vagueness of what we call static evaluation, um, which, which kind of implies that something never changes. That we once we have an opinion of something, we assume that and a person, for example, we may assume that, that it never changes. That person never changes, but we know that's not true. So we need to be conscious of saying, "Well, this person is this," and and expressing that in absolutes. Uh, whereas we want to say, "Well, you know, in my opinion, or last time I was around this person, they were kind of like this," um, as opposed to you know this this constant, because very little in life is absolutely constant. So we need to be cautious when we're using uh, static evaluation. We know that language also has an impact in terms of gender. Um, so there's two different approaches that people take to this. One is that there are significant differences in, in between the genders and language. It's where you can put the idea, you know, this old book that men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Like they're so different, fundamentally different. Um, you know, masculine and feminine communication are so different that they're from different worlds. Right? The other approach, though, says yeah, they're not that different. It's more like men are from North Dakota and women are from South Dakota, and that there are minor differences, right? And, you know, in the end, we, we the verdict is that, you know, we're coming more and more around to is that um, gender really isn't something that, that uh, is in communication, isn't something that's that's hardwired into, into either of the genders, that it's more about socialization, that over hundreds of years, men and, and you know, the masculine gender have been socialized to, to communicate in a certain way. And the same is true for those with a feminine gender, have been socialized to communicate in a particular way, right? So, um, but it's not really about masculine versus feminine. It's about what have you been taught to do and how you've been socialized as a communicator. And so those differences really don't exist in, you know, in a hardwired sense in men and women or, or masculine and feminine genders. They exist in the way that we've been taught to communicate, which makes those differences really um, more minor than than major. Um, there, there are things that can be overcome, can be changed, and have changed over time. So now that we know a little bit more about the impact of language, hopefully you'll, you'll um, consider that more as we use verbal communication, as we consider the way that we use language specifically, and, and just bear in mind the impact that language have, that it can be just as powerful as those sticks and stones. If you have questions about, uh, about the impact of language or anything else related to, to communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will give great consideration to your language use and the, the impact that that can have as a communicator.